everybody. We have a final presentation by Jim Drew. He's going to show the use of Supercar Pro in just a few minutes. It's quick and easy and down and dirty. Go, Jim. All right, Supercar Pro. It's a USB compatible board. You can run serial if you wanted to as well. Some guys are actually starting to run them with microcontrollers to be able to copy this. So if a guy wants to use his TI-99 or uh, Timer St. Clair to drive it, you could do that if you wanted. Um, I don't have the patience for those. So I uh, use USB, um, regular USB port. Um, in this particular instance, I'm using a three and a half inch drive. And um, I've wired it up so that the, um, the USB will actually power the three and a half inch drive. Hmm. So I can run the power cable, little cable I made, it's an adapter that uh, plugs into the board. Because you only need five volts on a uh, three and a half inch drive. Typically, really old ones are 12 volts as well, but most everything is, you know, is a five volt only. So um, you download the software from cbmstuff.com and you install it, install its drivers. And so now you get this, basically there's a multiple programs that are built into one app itself. Um, we've got a disk editor, an analyzer, and there's a, um, a copy program for doing disk copies. And there's also a utility um, section and this is really important for, um, especially guys doing three and a half inch discs, because the three and a half inch discs didn't survive well with time, and so they're really prone to having errors. So one of the things I recommend to people before you go make copies of any of the three and a half inch discs is to run the media test. Basically, it's an integrity test. Um, so if we tell it to run this, I put a blank disc in the drive. Oh, actually, I actually don't want to do that, huh? But this has got the uh, that copy we made for. Uh, we normally put it in there. Anyway, it, but it goes through all the tracks and it formats the, the track. It actually erases it with the erase head. And then it writes a particular data pattern, which is an eight microsecond pulse. And then it looks for a deviation in that. Um, if it's too far outside the window, it says this track is bad. And on the three and a half inch uh, disc, you're going to see from about track 74 on up, it's going to be trash on a lot of discs. Um, the generics didn't fare well at all. Uh, some of the really cool colored ones didn't fare well at all. Um, I have the best luck so far with uh, 3M discs, but like KAOs, I don't know what the deal is. And you expect them to, you know, survive really well in a fully enclosed, you know, case, but that wasn't the case. So this is really a, a great thing to do for, to make sure that you're going to be able to actually make a copy of a disc, because if you can't write to the disc reliably, there's no way you're making a copy, period. And so I did this really for myself more than anything because uh, it eliminates technical support issues. So did you make a, you know, a test of the disk? No. I get an email back going, Dad, disks are all bad. It's like, well, welcome to my life because I've thrown away hundreds of three and a half inch disks that are bad. And there's nothing you can do about them. You can't fix them. So for copying, it's pretty simple. Um, I've got a couple of things in here that make life easier for, um, for people. There's disk types. So you can do Amiga, Apple II, Atari ST, Atari 4800, Macintosh Low Density, IBM 360K, 720K, 1.44, uh, there's TRS80, there's TI-99, there's CPM. So basically, this kind of just fills in the blanks for what type of disk it is as far as how many tracks it's got, how many heads it's got. Because really, in the grand scheme of things, a disk is a disk when it comes to flux data. You know, you just have to know how many tracks you've got, and if you've got two heads or one head, and and if it's a 48 TPI drive or a 96 TPI for a, a five and a quarter, because uh, that means there's either two steps per track or one step per track. Uh, so 1.2 meg old floppies, um, kind of like these from back in the day, those are all 96 TPI drives. And the um, older TX, the old 360K drives, those are all 48 TPI drives. The 1541 is a 48 TPI disk. But the drive itself will do 96 TPI. That's what we have called half tracks. That's you have to do two steps for it. So I've got uh, you know if you select Commodore 64, uh, you can select half tracks if you want to copy them. Otherwise, it skips them. Just does you know every full track at that point. You can make SuperCard flux images of the disk itself and store them on your hard drive. And the flux image can be for any of the formats. And then you can write the flux image back if you want to to recreate the disk anytime you want. Uh, you can also um, copy drive to drive, so a single drive copy back to itself immediately. Or if you've got two drives connected into the SuperCard Pro board, you can actually go drive to drive directly. So it's a fast way to do it. 
I also have some conversion programs that are built into here. So for example, if you wanted to go from a 1541 format right to G64, it'll actually convert right to G64 for you. So at that point, you can take the G64, run it in WinVice, and run a copy protected disk at that point. Uh, there's a couple other emulators that are actually using SCP format now. If you've got uh, FSUAE or WinUAE, you can take an SCP flux image and you can load it right into WinVice, and you can run it a uh, copy protected disk just like an original. So 100% of everything ever made for the Amiga can be backed up and played on the WinVice at that point, which is nice. Can you do uh, three-inch disks for Spectrums? Awesome. Uh, yeah, in fact, you can. Uh, we've got a big following right now. I've never actually seen one in my life because I'm trying to find one right now, um, a drive. Uh, this is a, a three-inch disk. This was also used by Amstrad uh, oh, CPC. Amstrad. And so I've sold a lot of super cardboards to people running Amstrad uh, CPC. So if you go into the forums I've got on cbmstuff.com, you'll see I actually had to create a section just for these guys. Hmm. Because it was, I was surprised. Like I've never even seen the machine in my life. And I'm trying to find one. Um, so I can get the drive. Apparently what they've done, there's a little interface board people have made that converts a 30 pin or a 28 pin, whatever the Amstrad drive uses, to a 34 pin standard floppy. It's a little interface adapter. And the reason why they made those originally was so you could use a regular three and a half inch disk drive with the Amstrad because you couldn't find the drives or the disks anymore really. So, um, yes, and there are settings um, actually on our website for how to do all the Amstrad CPC oh. disks, and I, it works for all the copy protected disks, and they're making images, and they're sharing them, and everyone's thrilled, and so, I've, but, yeah, I, I know that they're a funky-looking disk like this. They are. Yeah. <laughs> really weird. So if anybody's got an Amstrad CPC in their closet, let me know, because I'm trying to find one, <laughs> and I've only found a few in France, really, that are, you know, affordable. I must spend a thousand dollars for a oh. eight-bit wow. old you know, machine just to be able to copy disks, just for testing disks actually, so I can make sure that they all work. Um, basically, every disk format, eight-inch <coughs> disks, um, anything that spins can be duplicated as long as it can be interfaced into a standard 34-pin floppy port. Um, and so that's really about it. I mean, it's, there's no frills in it. It's a flux copier, so there's no cheating it. Uh, it takes the physical tr transitions, the magnetic flux transitions from the disk and it records them via sampling, kind of like audio sampling's done. And it records at a 25 nanosecond resolution, um, which is pretty good when you consider that the standard, like a 1541, you'll have like eight microsecond or, or uh, 12 microsecond, or depending on what uh, density level it's in, um, of your time. So, you know, uh, 10 microseconds is a long, a lot of mano uh, nanoseconds, especially when you're doing, you know, it's four for every 100 nanoseconds for sampling. So we saw it today, like on the Amiga, um, it's 160 uh, sample rate for um, the lowest level of uh, bits, which is four microseconds. So the resolution difference between like this and like Cryoflux, Cryoflux is uh, sampling at 41.66 nanoseconds per bit, um, which is quite a bit different from 25. So the preservation I get is almost double the quality of what they've got. And so back to some of these programs I've got for like conversion to G64, I also have them for ADF, for Amiga. And I've got a ton of Amiga disks that are, you know, don't read real well. And I'm able to extract all the data successfully out of those because I can adjust the clocking window so well. Um, so I can actually pull any of these disks I've got that are bad in my Amiga and I can read them. And I can create a file, uh, image file, and then I can write them back at that point. And so basically I resurrect the disk. I'll be doing the same thing for um, Atari ST, and which is the same as PC. They're all the identical formats, um, and Amiga is a little bit different. But I'm doing um, the 1541 as well, and so I'll pretty much have everything covered as far as uh, what we call recovery for all the different formats. And um, so that's really the gist of the whole thing. It's for doing archiving and backup, and for running on emulation now as well. So if you're a Amiga guy. Um, it's pretty cool to take all the diagnosis things and all the things that were just a nightmare, you know, try to copy back in the day, and you can run them on Win UAE perfectly. And you can make this back. I mean, uh, uh, get get a an old disc and then make a, a a copy of it onto a new disc. Right. You can salvage it. Yeah. So you can make an image file of it, or go drive to drive, and it'll extract the data. It'll salvage all the data it can, recover out of it, and then it shows you on the screen too. I mean, you're doing. Okay, so when you when you push the start button, then yeah, 
this shows over here like uh, this would be the original on this side and this would be the copy on yeah. this side? Yeah, so this is it's just basically this is an index version oh, of it. there it goes. So it's going through it, every single upper lower head as it's going through. And that's the standard. Let's I can do, that's regular index copying. If I want to go to an ADF image, uh, I can say like the number of retries for each one of the sectors. I can go to make an image. I can go select an image, like whatever I want to call it. And then at that point, it'll go through. And it, everyone that's green is a good, successfully verified uh, track at that point. So if I do something like this, you can see what happens. It's sitting here and it's trying to figure out what's going on with the, the data on the disk. Originally, I had it error out, saying that there was a, you know the disk is out. But I found out a lot of times that these disks they don't seat correctly sometimes. And so you pop them in and out, sometimes they seat better, and now it'll read because it's slightly off from alignment for the head. So I got rid of that. But it, and you can see it just gets right through. After 50 retries or whatever you set this to, it'll actually pop up with a, a red square line. You know that one did not verify. Yeah. If it goes through multiple times and um, finds good sectors, but not all good sectors, it'll be yellow at first. It'll show you yellow, 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 and then it'll stay yellow to let you know that at least some sectors were recovered out of that. So, but it's not real, real fast, but it's not like really horribly slow. So this is how fast it is for all the stuff. And when I was doing the development with the 1541 stuff originally for this, it was all like da 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 and it's done. You know, it's, it's quick because you only have 35 tracks and you've got one side, not 80 tracks and two sides. So when I started doing this, I was like, oh my God, this takes forever to do these discs. So when I go back to 1541 now, it's all super duper fast. So for you know Commodore guys, it's it's really quick to, to do. So this is the salvaging parts, how it all works. Um, it's identical for whatever formats there are. And um, the image size typically for um, a 1541 disc is about two megs or so in size for flux. So that's what you expect to be storing for each one of your, your but that's an actual flux image. A um, GC, or G64 file is 340K thereabouts uh, for that. Um, and then Amiga, you know, they, they vary because there are a lot more data and depending on how much, you know, what the values of the flux were, your images for the Amiga will be anywhere from five to seven megs in size for a whole disk. So it's not a lot in the grand scheme of things. I mean, it was a lot back in then for size. But today, I mean, you know, how many can you fit on a, you know, a 32 gig SD card? Right. Yeah. A lot, you know, your whole collection, obviously. So. Yeah, uh, the hard drive is 52 megs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's back in the day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember I was living large and I got a 120 meg drive for my Amiga. I'll never fill this ever. Yeah. You know? I have a 160 gig hard drive in my uh, A1200 right now. I don't even hope to fill that up. I've got the whole WHD load co collection on it and it's not even a tenth of the way full. Yeah, my, my PC right now, I've got four terabytes of development data. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. So, any questions about this? I mean, you... Yes, Greg. Um, what? Do you like to see a three and a three inch yeah. disc? That's pretty cool. Is it oval? <laughs> kind of. Um, wobble, wobble. Is, what, what do you need to hook up? So your device and what kind of wire and what kind of drive do you need? Uh, you can use a three and a half inch floppy drive from a standard PC, uh, a floppy drive cable and either connect it to the supercard board directly and run it off the USB for power, which is what I'm doing here. Or you can run an external power supply, which I uh, actually brought with me, like a regular PC power supply, you know, the typical Molex connectors for the, the drives, which is plugged into my five and a quarters. And uh, so the floppy drive cable and... So standard floppy cables. Yeah, standard and, floppy cables. And they plug into your board. Yep. It's a uh, standard 34 pins. USB. Standard USB, it's a uh, mini B. Like your free cell phone, so yes. it's identical. Oh, so you have the power. Yeah, I got the power for this whole thing. Drive. Basically, the power, I mean, the drive right from USB. But what about the five and a quarter drives? Uh, you got to have an external power supply for them because they need 12 volts yeah. to run them. But like I said, all these original drives are they're, they're all five five volts. You know, no big deal to run them this way. And they run about uh, 250 to 300 milliamps of current to run them. And USB typically is up to 500. For it. That's why I've got the USB spec in here for too, because when you power up any kind of USB device, you can program how much current it's going to use. And it's programmed for 500 milliamps, so your port on your laptop or your desktop will tell you that this device is not compatible because it needs more power. Jim, for yeah. for uh, like like uh, resurrecting Amiga just and 
re re archiving them onto a floppy disk. So you would need like an Ami an Amiga mechanism, like a a Shinone draw. Uh, no, drive. use this. Use any three and a half inch oh, floppy. Oh, just use any three. Yep, and a half any three and a half inch PC floppy drive. Does it have to be the specific Amiga nope. drive? Nope, not at all. Hmm. And for uh, would that be the same for like a Commodore disk? I mean, would you use any five and a quarter? Any five and a quarter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. So in uh, John that was here, he had a stack of right. drives that were clean to line and you know it's obviously if you're gonna be doing archiving of your collection, you're gonna wanna have a drive that's a good drive. Right. And so John is one of the few people that actually he buys drives off the internet, he cleans them, puts them on a oscilloscope, aligns everything so they're perfect, and then he tests them. We've got some test programs that we use, you know, as a kind of a benchmark. If it loads bounty bob strikes back, it's probably gonna be good. That and rapid lock. Those are the ones that were really difficult to, to work with drive alignment. 21 second backup copy? How's that? Um, you know what's funny is that I can copy everything ever made for the Commodore 64 with this except for 21 second backup. And I'll tell you why. Okay. That is the most unique protection I've ever seen in my life. And until I actually looked at it, and of course I looked at it you know, 25 years later, uh -huh. back in the day, you know, I wrote uh, Keymaster, I did Gemini and Apollo and Supercard Pro or Plus and Supercard and Echo and all these different copy programs back in the day. And it was a cardinal rule that your copy program did not copy your competitor's program. <laughs> okay. And the reason for that is you didn't want your competitor's program being spread through the user group meetings because it would pick up popularity at that oh, point. Okay. So it was like nobody could copy each other's programs at that point type of thing. Okay. So, um, I, so 20, you know, 25 years later, I look at 21 second backup, which was my competitor, and I try to copy it with Supercard Pro, uh -huh. and I wouldn't copy. So I thought, okay, so now I gotta figure out why, because now you know, it's, it's a vendetta at this point. <laughs> so I look at it, and so I look at the drive code. I, I used, um, I actually had one of my drives here last year. I think it's got a digital display you guys saw. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's got, it had extra RAM on it, uh -huh. and it had RAM piggybacked on the 2K RAM. I had a switch where I could actually load a program, flip a switch, and it would move the memory up into a different location. And I could go turn off the drive, or actually uh, reset the drive, keep the power to it, and I could use a drive bond, and I could go look at the code. So I could capture it, I know exactly what's going on. So I did the same thing with, I actually did with my drive. And I looked at the drive code, and I was like, I don't see anything out of the ordinary at all. It was a very simple protection. All it simply does, it's got um, 10, 5, 12 byte sections that it looks at. It, reads the data in, steps ahead, reads the data in, steps ahead, reads the data in, steps ahead, and it does that 10 times, and it's done. It compares the data. And it was always failing, and it drove me nuts. Turns out what they were doing is that they were relying on the fact that if you step the head, there's a certain period of time that goes by before the head moves. Okay. okay. Charles LeBorn, the guy who wrote this software, and I verified it because I, I made a copy program for Supercard Pro, or a Plus later on, um, you write out the data, tell the head to step, and some arbitrary time later, the head physically starts to move in the steps. So he was writing during the transition of the step. So from track to track, it was physically writing data. So what okay. we would do, it go between track 10, 10 and a half, and 11, back to 10 and a half, back to 10, and they did that back and forth uh, to be, uh, well, two times each, and, or three times each plus one, so it was 10 times they actually did this. And so basically, you look at it like a, on a graph, it'd be doing this, okay? So after you tell the drive to step, it takes 273 bytes <coughs> worth of time that goes by before the head starts to actually physically move. Because remember, a head is a coil. Okay. And to make a, a, a head step, you energize the coil. And it takes a period of time for that energy to build up before the magnetic energy is able to overcome and go clunk and make the head actually rotate, or the, the separate motor rotate. So, the transition period from when it actually goes from one track to the next track is about another 27 bytes of time. So for 27 bytes, it's skewed as it's going, and so it's actually writing that data. So this guy figured this out back, you know, 25 years ago. So what I had to do for the Supercard Plus, I actually, I said, well, I, I could copy everything there was with this, with that product, except for this program. I didn't know it because we didn't copy our competitors' programs. I would have done it. I would have figured it out back then. So I figured, okay. So I made a copy program just specifically for this, and I reproduced this head stepping thing, and the copy loads just fine, doing it that way. So the reason why we can't do that with the PC drives 
is the same reason why you can't use that program on a 1541-2 or a 1571. The speed of the head step is different. Uh, so the transition time from one track to the next is not the same as the original Alps or Neutronics mechanisms. Hmm. So we can't duplicate those on the PC drives. Now I'm sure if you found a particular PC drive brand that had the exact same step speed, it, we could do it that way. But you'd have to know exactly when to start the, the step and all this stuff. It would be a program, you know, specifically for, you know, 21 second backup. So for that, I'm okay with that. I already have the ability to do it, so we can still copy 100% of everything ever made at that point. So that's the only program. And I've copied lots of stuff for lots of different oddball things, rolling keyboards and... Yeah, I think, I think it was Joe May. Yeah, Joe May out of the scan group down in, in Caste, California. He says, uh, Robert, uh, 21 second backup coming. If you ever find that, it's, it's worth, you know, a fortune of it. It is? Okay, yeah, here's the reality. There's a guy on eBay right now that has a brand new one in the box with a cable. <laughs> and every time I post it on eBay, it's $33,333.33. <laughs> and the reason why he says that, it says right in his ad, um, the reason why it's this price is that there was a Atari 2600 cartridge called Air Raid that's extremely rare, and that's the price it sold for on, on eBay. Okay, so it just so happens I had a guy contact me last week, and what I had seen was 21 second backup 2.0. 4.1 okay. was the elusive one that I'd never seen, okay? And so he goes, yeah, I got one. So I have an original one. Okay, I was all excited because I figured it's got to be a different kind of production. It's the same production. <laughs> same program works to copy it. So I was kind of bummed. But so that's my last program that I was looking for in all of my Commodore stuff was this one. I've been looking for two years for it. So right before Convex, I find it and found out that it's the same production. So I was hoping that I could write some new program or... Right, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I, you know, so obviously nobody copied it back then. Right. And people cracked it all the time, but nobody was able to, to actually copy the disk. So there's another program I'm actually looking for. It's his as well, and it's called a super fast file copier. Has anybody ever seen that before? It was a file copier, kind of like uh, how Mike did Fast Hack them, oh, okay. okay? But it was done with the parallel cable. So it was all, it was super fast. You could copy all the files on a disk in, I don't know, eight, 10 seconds. Oh. So it was super, super duper fast like that. I've seen Joe May do that. So I don't know if it was that program, but he'll copy it. I've seen him copy disks like super crazy fast using a parallel cable. Yeah, I've got parallel cable support for Supercard Pro as well. This is strictly for files. Like, you select files, individual files, and then copy them with a parallel cable okay. instead of using the whole entire disk that way. So that's it. Any other questions at all? You have a question? Uh, yeah. And I just was, I don't know, you may have said this and I just missed it, but I know you said you could make an image that's playable in like WinUAE and stuff mm -hmm. where it's just, you know, it includes the copy protection and just right. works. Uh, are you able to write back a disk image sure. that oh, yeah, yeah. would include the copy protection? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you write an SCP image, you can select it. Just like here, like if we were to read this and just to select an image file, we could, it'll show up here. And then we write it back, it shows here as it's writing on this side. So yeah, we can reproduce anything. We can make uh, images, and we can do drive-to-drive -drive copies directly. Most people put them in image format, really. And I know that a lot of people are sharing them, and you know, that's, it is what it is, but, you know. Yeah? Drive-to-drive, do you need two, two of your cards, or is there two? No. Uh, basically, just like any floppy controller, you always have two drive outputs oh. on it. So you, if you're gonna do more than two, you need you know, a second card for it. Okay. But uh, if you take a look at any kind of floppy drive cable, you're going to find a twist at the end. Oh. And that twist is for, that's actually drive zero at the twist. The inner one's the drive one. So every floppy controller made for the PC and all that. Uh, that 34 pin connector itself is designed for handling two floppies. It was designed for handling four floppies back in the day. But for some reason that it got abandoned. I guess nobody used four floppies on the computer anymore. Just two. But I guess four would be great for doing like, you know, hard drive backup back in the day. I remember us having stacks of disks for, you know, our ten, our ten meg drive or whatever we had back in the day. Yeah. You know, take a lot of disks to copy them. So, any other questions at all? I mean, it's it's a retail product. I charge 100 bucks for it, or 99.95. Um, comes with software. It's lifetime warranty on it. You can run it over your car. I'll give you another one. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's, I build all, you can run it through your hair. It's, you know, there's no static problems with it. I mean, I, I design stuff for military uh, applications, so it's got to be able to handle, you know, I, I design stuff for customers, you know, the general public back in the day. And it used to drive people nuts at my assembly house in Lake Havasu, where I'm from, because they built all the implant cards for the Amiga back in the day. 
I come waltzing through, no static strap. I grab boards, throw them through my hair, <laughs> like, and they were just yeah. panic. Yeah. So I designed an implant, actually, so you could plug it in with a power on the Amiga. And so we used to do that demos all the time at the uh, at, uh, World of Commodore show. We would take a 2000 open, and we just go, oh, like this. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's fine. It didn't hurt it at all. Oh, wow. It's all buffered. I mean, we just, but we know how the public is because, yeah. you know, and there's a funny story. I don't know if I shared it last time I was here, but for tech support, that's another reason why you build things like that, is so you don't have to worry about it. You know, somebody damaging your, the computer, which is our biggest fear. You ruined my Amiga. You know, you ruined my XYZ, whatever it is. Um, so this guy calls, oh, I can't get this thing to work, and he ran the diagnostics program, and it was saying that there was no board, and I asked him, like, is the board seated? He goes, everything's it's fine the way it is. It was on and on, an hour on the phone. So I said, all right, so I want you to do is remove the card from the Amiga, I mean, power free computer, remove the card from the Amiga, put it in a box, and then he goes, well, I haven't plugged it in yet. Oh. I said, what do you mean you haven't plugged it in yet? He goes, well, I want to make sure the software worked first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, the board is needed for the software to work. Oh, well, I didn't think that. And I had specifically asked him, is the card seated? Oh, it's fine. And we thought it meant it was seated in the box. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> so for technical support, I try to make things that are very robust so we don't have to worry about things like that. So that's it, really. I mean, if you guys have any questions at all. Okay, anyway. thank you, Jim. Oh, wait a minute. Question? Did you hear Question. that tech Question. support phone call to Verizon, oh. or, or to uh, Comcast? It was on the news last week. Huh. I like this one. Oh, the yeah. The guy trying to get the people to stay with their internet service. Uh -huh. No, I didn't hear about that one. Oh. I did hear about one. Um, people saw this. This was, like, crazy. Um, somebody sent their laptop in for repair to HP or, or Compaq and like that, and so he had a hard drive problem, right? So he gets it back, and it's a different hard drive because the hard drive was destroyed. And he just read these guys the riot act for this thing. My entire life was on that computer. He's just swearing at him. You can tell he's just spitting in the phone. I, I've lost everything in life. I might as well be dead now, and all this stuff. He didn't do any backups. <laughs> They lost everything on the hard drive, and people take it for granted that you know that your computer's going to power on. So, okay, that's it. Thank you, Jim. Thanks.